All right, guys. Well, I'm sitting here with Zach Broom. He's an account executive at Procurie. And you guys, Zach has like over 30 videos on YouTube of him talking about the industry, talking to his customers who are actually other salespeople in the IT space. And uh, I'm really stoked to have Zach here. Talk about a handful of topics, but like how salespeople can use content to like better help build relationships with customers. Um, we know that's so important in our space because people really want to work with who they like and content can help with that, especially mm -hmm. video. But you and I were just chatting. Mm -hmm. you, you took a nice little break from yeah, the video content at the end of last year. So like, let, let's start there. Like, let's talk about this break because you had made dozens of videos and then you just kind of went cold for a few months. Like, yeah, I think, I think a lot of people that do videos know who Gary Vaynerchuk is. So he kind of like inspires you a little bit and you read some of his books. You're like, I really need to get into the content game. And you don't really know what you're going to say at first. So at first, you, you know, you're thinking, you're thinking. And then at some point you get, I don't know if you get frustrated. I did, but you get frustrated. You're, you're like, okay, I'm just going to talk, just talk. And then whatever comes out, comes out, just post it and, and move on. Just start creating. And then over time you refine the skill. And so I started getting into it. And when I really thought about it, thinking about everything we do in my role, my current role at Procurie, um, I was able to create you know, 10, 15 videos pretty quickly, but then you start having to really think about it. You wanna be thoughtful, you don't wanna to be too repetitive. Yeah. Like, oh, I've already said this, I've, how could I possibly make another video? Like, I've said everything about my job, like, it, that's it. It's exactly, and then you start thinking, okay, well, are people getting tired of me saying the same thing? Or maybe my video is boring, or am I being like, am I, am I, do I sound very monotone, and you know, or whatever it may be. And then obviously I, I stopped, I kind of got uh, unmotivated. Not, I wasn't unmotivated, I was just, I was just busy. You know, we brought somebody onto uh, my team here at Procuri. Uh, There's some organizational changes going, so you're thinking all these different directions. It's becoming the end of the year. Anybody in sales knows the end of the year packs a lot of pressure. Um, so I just kind of got off of it. And then, you know, going into the new year, I was like, I really need to focus on this. So throughout January, you know, it's like every week posted every single week and then over time you know you know I, I think I'll be able to, to include things even outside of procure maybe some sales advice maybe some sales things that have that I've seen work for me work for others um, and then the industry is always evolving so really just kind of like going through it and, and talking about industry trends things like that that can be really valuable for our, for our channel folks mm -hmm. yeah it's it's really hard with anything maybe you mm -hmm. know like hey I've got my key accounts I've been selling into for a couple mm -hmm. years now, but I know there's these new accounts I want to break into. Oh, I've yeah. got to block time to, you know, do my prospecting. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to neglect that, let alone making content because, you know, if we're hitting our number based on everything we've already got, mm -hmm. why am I making new content? Like what's the right. point? You know, I'm, I'm close to hitting my number, whatever it might be. And I, I've certainly fallen into that trap where mm -hmm. it's like, I'm so busy. I'm hitting the goals I need to hit, but it's, it's hard to get past like the immediate quarter and think, right. you know, two quarters, a year out, because mm -hmm. that's that's the real value of some of this stuff. Yeah, well, it's easy to get complacent and people are like, yeah. okay, I've got this book of business, but you really want to evolve. And I know we talked about this earlier. A lot of what we do is you don't get to interact with customers so much. You hear them behind the phone or you have emails with them and you have this electronic relationship for years. Um, and so it's nice to see people or have people actually see you, you know, and this, you know, it, it, it's another way to connect. It's an unintrusive way to connect. You know, if you want to watch it, great. If you don't, that's okay too. Yeah. Um, and if you learn something along the way, even better. Um, so it's kind of a thing like, well, why not do it? You know, you have nothing to lose, you know, as long as you're, you know, providing some sort of value and you're not annoying people, it's an unintrusive way to even prospect, not just maintain current relationships, but but the prospect, some people come across, you wouldn't believe some of the messages I get. Some people say, hey, I saw you on LinkedIn. Is this something you can help with? You know, or even at a company, like if I'm working with a, a large reseller, um, which, you know, we do, and there's there's hundreds of reps at this reseller. So I might know 20 people in California or Texas or wherever, but I don't know anybody in Colorado. Right. And, you know, and so they see like, oh, I, I see you work with our company, but who are you and, and what do you do? And it's like, I've been working with you guys for years. Like, okay, so let me explain this, you know? So it's a unintrusive way just to let people know what you do, who you are, let them know you're a real person and hopefully a genuine person and not come across as just some super slick sales guy that's sending emails and calls like, hey, are you gonna buy, are you gonna buy? It's like, no, like I'm here to help you grow your business yeah. because what we do is really kind of a niche market. It, it is pretty a niche. niche market. And, 
without getting into the technical details, mm -hmm. you've been in the IT industry now for six years? Five years. Five, five, five years? Five, yeah, five or six. I have to look at the date to confirm, but going into five to six years. So, and you're you're based on what I've seen, you're so or I haven't seen you years ago, but I would speculate you're so much more fluent in the language of IT. But you're more talking about like the business value some of Procurious Solutions can add to uh, a reseller partner mm -hmm. via their end cu end customer, and so. Um, You've recently been making some whiteboard videos. Yeah, well, very amateur, by the way. Very <laughs> amateur, but that's very tough to do when you're new and you don't understand some of the fundamentals. Now mm -hmm. you're just so much more competent. How's it been doing some of those whiteboard videos? The whiteboards, I think it's effective. You know, sometimes you get on the tangent and you want to like draw over here, draw over there, and then if you jump into the middle of the video, it's like, whoa, what like what happens here? It's funny, Jess, the person that I brought on the team, uh, you know, a few months ago, she, she brought up a note where I first was explaining to her how the industry works. And it just looks like a foreign language. Like it doesn't even make sense. So on the whiteboard, I try to be careful, but I, I think it illustrates the point better. Mm -hmm. um, again, they're very amateur, so it's not, I hope people can follow along. My handwriting's pretty bad. Um, but I think it's an effective way to get the message across. And I think when you put, particularly, and I know we'll get into this later, when we're selling to other sales reps, they wanna hear the numbers. So, you know, it's easy to write the number, like 100,000 or 200,000, it really kind of like gets, okay, I get it. Um, so it's, it's, it's been good, and, you know, especially, I, I kind of wish I had more of the, the whiteboard explanations when I first started, because I didn't know a thing yeah. about the data center space. You know, when I think of IT, I think, okay, I'm going to go to Best Buy. I, I tell people I'm in IT all the time, and they say, oh, what kind of computer should I buy? And I'm like, I have no idea. That's very different. It's very <laughs> different than what we do in the data center space. So. Um, it's very unique. I, I remember Jeremy, who is a guy I work with, um, storage guru. And when I first interviewed for the job years ago, um, he came in, he said, hey, I'm, I'm Jeremy Foddenberry, and uh, I run the storage, I, I manage all the storage uh, here at Procuring. And my initial thought was, no joke, was like, okay, so this guy's like the, the maintenance guy, like the janitor guy. He manages like the storage facilities, not store IT storage, but like storage with junk. And yeah. like, you know, like, janitor cha closet. like chairs and yeah. like the old plastic plants that it, don't fit in the room it, anymore after exact, our renovation. Exactly. Yeah. So in my thought, my thought in the interview was like, well, why am I meeting with this guy? Like, are they looking at me to be a, like a, like a, like a janitor here? Like in store, like store all this junk or what? But, but now I know what storage is, you know, and like, you know, learn all the product lines. But at first it's, it was definitely a learning curve. So hopefully the white, going back to the whiteboard, hopefully it helps illustrate the point. Do you get this question a lot from your friends and family? Zach, what is the cloud? You know, I do. Well, it's funny you say. Because I get, I get that all the, like, pe like, and it's just so going back to storage. It's uh -huh. just computers in a data center exactly. that are optimized in a way to put data there and recall it in a fashion that's helpful for a business or people. Like that's all the cloud is, and you know, Amazon just happens to do it, or Facebook has big data centers, and so <laughs> you know, you're, iPhone, you're, going you're loading iCloud. your pictures up in the cloud, but like. You, those are some of the fundamentals that when you're new to IT and you have to sell these things, you don't, when a customer is talking about cloud, you don't know those things. I, I feel like the average person doesn't. And it's, it's pretty basic to us. Right? Yeah, it's, it is very basic. So it's funny. So like if you're not in the industry, most people just think the cloud is just this mysterious, magical thing. And time is just, you know, really elevated. You know, things have just innovated over time. And it's just, how is this it's magic? Like my parents, are, you know, even ask, like, is there not in the industry or... They're just like the cloud, it's in the cloud, like wherever that is. And so if you're not in the industry, people think it's this mystical land, but reality is just a, a better business idea that companies came up with like AWS or, or Apple or whatever and say, hey, like we're gonna store this in the cloud, we're gonna store this all on our servers because infrastructure can get extremely complicated. So for AWS to go to a business or you and say, hey, I'm gonna take that complication out, you just tell me the storage that you need and how much you, know, you need to operate your business and we'll do all that stuff behind the scenes. And so it's on the Amazon cloud or iCloud or, or whatever, but you, you kind of got into it. It's, it's just hardware somewhere else. Yeah. You know, it's not invisible. It's, you know, there are actual like, computers. There's actual <laughs> computers still involved. Um, obviously some, you know, you, you can get to the nitty-gritty of the hyper-converged network, like all, all these different things, you know, but nonetheless, it's hardware. It's, right. it's still a physical asset somewhere. Yeah. Well, and may, maybe this is a good sort of, like, we're going to, pitch your company and what you do at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. 
there, there's a very interesting area because companies have their own data centers. A lot of companies don't use Amazon for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Maybe that maybe they haven't started using the cloud yet. Mm-hmm. And so, or let's say it's a hospital because of HIPAA and data compliance for whatever mm-hmm. reason, they want to make sure their patient's data is very secure. So they mm-hmm. keep it in their own data centers. Mm-hmm. What are you most excited about helping you know, partner companies, mm-hmm. then working with end customers to you know make their data centers better? Because there's a few like I, I think areas you're you're a specialist in, mm-hmm. but um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Like, what, yeah, what do you so love selling? There's yeah. so many. I, I I like selling maintenance and hardware. Uh, it's pretty black. Well, I like buybacks too, but it gets it's still fun and it's it's very helpful for our customers. Um, but everything we do kind of goes back to the cloud, especially in today's world. Yeah, as a trend, like a big trend that's moving the, this stuff in a direction. Yeah, the trend the trend I'm seeing is, like you said, it really depends on the organization. There's a lot of red tape in big banks, hospitals, and, and you know even the government entities or missile defense programs. I mean, there's so many different organizations with different pieces of tape that block different things. So you really, you know, each one's unique in its own way. But for the most part, a lot of folks want to move to the cloud, but there are security concerns, so they'll have like a DR site that they want to keep on site somewhere. Um, but for our partners, the most exciting for me is because our partners dealing with resellers, they're selling so many different things. There's so much. They're selling a lot more cooler technology than what we're selling. Yeah. Well, and not just hardware; they sell software, enterprise so software, software, software well. solution, yeah. applic- different applications, all these different yeah. cool things that can run people's businesses more effectively. And efficiently, whereas I'm just providing them the tools to get them to to be able to sell those things as well. So the, the exciting thing for me is if they have a customer that wants to move to the cloud, what are they doing with that old gear? I can buy that back with those funds. They can then go to the cloud, or they can go act as a rebate and help uh, push that initiative with their customer. It's literally um, adding to IT budget. Exactly. Baking it back in to add to the IT budget, maintenance costs, which like, everything we're doing for our partners, where people look at it as like uh, some some of them are all of them are sales reps or you know the sales reps that I work with, they look at it as a lower amount of transactions or like if the transaction's not as, as high of an amount, it's less margin, but it's actually the reverse. You know, so like okay, they want to do this ten million dollar deal. Why am I going to mess around with this hundred thousand dollar thing with Zach and Procure or whoever? It's like well, hey, like let's pull back the covers a little bit. And if you can get this hundred thousand dollar deal and bake that into your deal, you just raise the bar significantly because a hundred thousand dollars is still a lot to other organizations, and that's other applications or incentives that you can pitch in your solution for your customer. So whether it's saying, hey, you don't need the latest and greatest, you know, IBM server for um, a DR site, you know, we can go this route and that'll save your customer money. Hey. You're doing a migration to the cloud, whether it be three, six, 18 months, whatever it is, there's no reason to go with the OEM maintenance because you're gonna spend so much money doing so. Mm-hmm. So save your money here during that migration and then all that money you're saving can add up to millions of dollars. Um, you know, even on smaller projects, thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then you can bake that into all these other goals that your customers have. So it's a really unique way. It's, a, it's like a Swiss army knife that customers can use and I see reps, reps that really embrace it and get it, see the value in it. And once they do, they they become, you know, in their organizations, much higher level sales reps and their customers are happier and they're doing all kinds of, they're covering everything for their customers, not just, hey, here's, you know, some new, here's a new EMC refresh, thanks, bye. Like, you're really covering a whole host of things for them. So, um, I mean, I, I see reps, again, I, I don't wanna harp on it too much, but the reps, crush it yeah. <laughs> just to be blood they crush it by really leveraging the really three key areas that we do you know the hardware the maintenance and the, and the itad piece um and baking that into all of their proposals mm-hmm. it's kind of a long-winded answer no I, I i i love it man and it seems to me too there's a lot of education because mm-hmm. i know i used to work at a bar mm-hmm. or reseller and i have friends and and Folks I've worked with at, in, in a past life were at just other distributors. Mm-hmm. Folks who work at OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, mm-hmm. both software and hardware. And this is just such a nice offering to just fill some gaps. Be, yeah. Because a lot of times, the VAR has great engineering capability, mm-hmm. but you're so much more focused on implementation. Mm-hmm. Or if you're an MSP, you're so much more focused on the day-to-day. Mm-hmm. This this cloud migration project that's going to take 12 to 18 months Mm -hmm. you know it's nice to have an extra resource there not just financially but someone who can act as a strategic partner Mm -hmm. and think about hey as 
as these assets decommission, you're not going to replace them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's just have the plan now. I know you're not tackling this migration for nine or 12 months. Mm -hmm. I know it's going to decommission later, but it's, it's just, it's really interesting to me what you guys do. So thanks for walking through that. Yeah. Yeah. So just, I'll do one more quick example is massive healthcare company. We're doing it with a, with a reseller we partner with here in Atlanta and they're migrating over to the cloud and they're off their NetApp here and NetApp wanted to charge them. I think it's, it's an 18 month migration is the estimated. Obviously people in the industry know that can go up or down, you know, but 18 months is what we're working with. And um, NetApp was charging like almost a million dollars to support this gear going to, to the cloud. One, they're probably charging because they're upset because they're going to the cloud and the cloud has nothing to do, or it's not NetApp's gear or anything like that. So they're moving off a NetApp platform. So they're probably gonna charge more for that. And they came to Procurious like, hey, we can do this for like 200,000. So there's $800,000 they're saving. And it's and to them, it's like, wow, this is really helping us out. Significant. And exactly. And then I say, hey, look, you know, I can tell you what this equipment's valued at now. It could be different in 18 months. So not only are you going to save $800,000, we might buy this equipment back. It's a lot of flash storage, stuff like that. So it has a lot of value. And I say, hey, once this migration is complete, we'll come on site. We'll remove all these assets. We'll even sweep the floor for you. And there's an action, there's an extra added layer of bonus, like in cost savings for them. Well, and it's done in a compliant way. I mean, the data is it's, erased in a, exactly. in a compliant way. I mean, the end customer has certificates so that we, you know, mm -hmm. everybody's covered from a compliance mm -hmm. standpoint. Exactly. It's safe in terms of data governance, exactly. which is really important. Exactly. And one thing I get from our customers a lot, or even like on the phone with end users, their end users with them, is the end users really like the idea of having two companies over one. So if they're using a reseller here in Atlanta and that reseller is leveraging Procure as a distributor for these services, you're getting two bona fide companies to help you manage these projects. Mm -hmm. So it's really a value add when you have two stout companies really supporting this end user, this end customer. And to end customers, it's a lot of value. It's not saying, hey, okay, it's just one company's got your back. It's, hey, these are two you know, fortified companies that have your back during all these projects. Well, that's why the channel is so powerful. I think end customers, even historically, you know, I've gone to meetups for, you know, folks in architecture and folks mm -hmm. are in, you know, data analytics, what mm -hmm. have you in the directors of IT are there. Mm -hmm. Directors of IT know like, oh, I work with this reseller mm -hmm. or channel partner. And they mm -hmm. know, you know, sometimes other entities are in, involved, um, but that's the power of the channel because the end customer can mm -hmm. really end up working with those two or three powerful companies and right. get everything they need. Exactly, and it all yeah. just goes through, it's kind of like, you know, uh, you know, somebody's buying EMC solution from a, a big reseller. That reseller will still bring EMC into the, into the, uh, conversa yeah, yeah. To the conversation because they know, EM, like, you know, they're buying an EMC solution, but they're doing it through the reseller. They just go to the reseller, all funnels through the reseller. And they know that the reseller behind the scenes is gonna engage with all these different partners that they, that they have to really, you know, nail down a solution for them. Um, so it's a really unique way to go to market and, you know, I encourage everybody to, yeah. to uh, engage us. And, <laughs> I, and I can tell you love it, love it. And so yeah, shameless plug for Procure Zach on YouTube, go check him out. <laughs> this is like the, the, the focus of his, his content. So if you're an account executive, um, either enterprise, uh, uh, an account manager, inside sales at one of these uh, value added resellers or solution providers, go check out Zach's mm -hmm. channel. It's, it's really good. Stuff. Yeah. You might not want to watch it. You know, it's probably something better to watch at nine o'clock at night you know, <laughs> as you're winding down, but it's definitely, if you're in the business, I, I hope it's, it's educational. And, and I have found that the reps that, that do watch these, it does have a direct impact on their business. And it, and again, I'm not saying that just to say that, you know, these yeah. videos, I'm not making money off you by watching these videos. You can do it with somebody else, whatever, but just, I hope I do a good job of explaining how the industry works because it really is a niche industry, particularly, you know, there's so many different rules with deal registration, the hardware not being available, lead times, maintenance cost high, decommission, cloud, all these different things are going on. Um, so for us to really unravel those those things for you, um, hopefully it's a real value add and, and yeah, they can take it into their business the very next day and go to their customers with it. Mm -hmm. It's huge. And maybe to wrap, you know, we'll spend like seven minutes on it. Something okay. like that's an arbitrary amount of time, but seven yeah. minutes feels good. Uh, with respect to like going back to the content thing, mm -hmm. but more as a sales professional, we are yeah. we are chatting about this. You were a college athlete, mm -hmm. and you learned a lot about work ethic. And it, it seems right. to me, folks that are like really passionate about music, or if they were an ex athlete, or mm -hmm. maybe you know like 
runners who in their adult career, mm -hmm. you know, maybe 20 years in, they still run marathons the, yeah. or the, the people that go do yoga all the time or you're hitting the gym at 5.30 in the morning. You know, some of those routines can transfer over to our personal lives, but really affect our professional lives. And oh, yeah. you've discovered recently a little bit about your morning routine. Mm -hmm. I know you're always the first one in the office. Like, dude, you're yeah. here at like 7.30 every day. And when I roll in, I'm like, surely I'm going to beat everybody. <laughs> There's Zach Broom. He's here. So like, what are your thoughts on just what you learned from being an athlete and now bringing some of this like discipline to your morning to have like the best day you can as as an adult, yeah. but also a sales pro. Yeah, so there's a, I'll try not to get too philosophical here. Um, no, please, let it rip. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of different things. So a lot of, uh, you, you may or may not know, I, I played football at the University of South Carolina. Um, this was, you know, when Coach Spurrier was there. So we were a pretty good team in the SEC East at that time. And there was a, uh, our strength coach at the time was Coach Fitzgerald. He recently went to the Houston Texans. Um, he was at Harvard for a long time. Super smart guy, very intense guy. And I remember when he took the job uh, at the Houston Texans and he was leaving and he came up to me and he said, Broom, do not be another statistic. You are not, regardless of what God you believe in or anything that you believe in or don't believe in, you were not put on this earth to be average. And then he said some cuss words and some things like that to really get you fired up. Wow. Uh, but it really stuck. intense. Dude. Yeah, it really stuck with me. as like, you know, we're not here to be average. So I try to get the most out of, of every day. So I do get up at 5 a.m. every day. Um, in terms of getting being the first one in the office, I, I typically am here in Buckhead because I live closest closer than most people. So Atlanta, by the way. Atlanta, yeah. So I I do uh, I have that advantage, um, but I've always had the mentality to not let anybody outwork you, and I live by that. Now, colleagues or people within the company, or even you coming into our organization. Um, some people, I disagree with the notion that people think, okay, if you're in your cube, then you're working. If you're not in your cube, you're not working. Um, and I disagree with that. So like when people say like, oh, I'm in the office all day, I think that's important, but that doesn't, I don't think that necessarily equates to how hard you work. Um, for the me, intensity of which you work, the, yeah, the highest level impact you're yeah, making as you work. Yeah, like all these I, things. exactly. So, I mean, it, it all goes back to, you know, my training as a, as a kid and even in college was, you know, when I first get up, it needs to be productive. And even, you know, from five to seven or five to eight, before I even get in the office, I've already done so many different things, whether it be from personal development to working out, um, to following up on emails, trying to think of content, reaching out to people in unique ways, or even things that are outside of Procure, things that I want to do, whether it be real estate or other things that I like and enjoy, I'm focusing on in the morning. And so by, you know, when people are waking up at seven, I like to think that I'm already past them to a certain extent like while the competition's sleeping i'm awake i can promise you that yeah got to um, have a leg up yeah and the same thing goes in the night and i'm not the best i'm not saying i'm some hall of fame salesperson or person or better than anybody because i do that it's just what fuels me and it's what gets me going you know um jocko willink has his book out you know freedom equals discipline um and i think that's true you know a lot of times when you feel like you don't have discipline in your life it's easy to let you know the an idle mind is the devil's workshop, right? Even though you don't like working out, you don't like getting up in, in the morning, but when you do, you do feel like energized and you mm -hmm. do feel like you're you're on track to, to your goals. So again, not trying to get too philosophical, but you know, I, I try to work as hard as I can. And if I find out somebody's working harder than me, I can promise you I will find a way to work harder. That's um, humbly too. I mean, obviously we're talking about it now, but I, I try to do it behind the scenes. I don't, you know, illustrate how hard I'm working. I try to let the results speak for itself. So. Yeah. I can also speak to the fact you you genuinely want to help people because mm -hmm. I've seen you. You help mm -hmm. your colleagues. Um, even just your content, man, that's like extracurricular. That's not part of your core job function. And yes, right. indirectly it helps, but also like you just you just like educating. Um, you're you're a bit of a natural teacher in that and so obviously you're not here to tear other people down. But you are right. confident and competitive. And I think right. having that uh, confidence and competitive edge. Like I've personally experienced this, we're talking philosophically, mm -hmm. not always having confidence mm -hmm. and maybe not always valuing my skills and myself as much as I should. Right. And that comes in waves. Right. And and you know, sometimes momentum's important. And when you're feeling confident, when mm -hmm. you're feeling good, it's really easy to squander that by like not being disciplined. Oh, like yeah. like yeah. I know when I when I have discipline, it builds some confidence. And that makes me want to be disciplined. And then it's like just like this amazing cycle. And when you're down, it, it's tough to start. I don't know, maybe that's well, a good it goes, question. It goes back to your routine, which is why yeah. I'm so adamant about 5 a.m., whether 
how I, if, if, it, if you've heard it before, if it was easy, everybody could do it. If yes. you want to be great, if being great or being great at what you do was easy, everybody could do it. So I think it all starts with your routine. So I mean, even as simple as the 5 a.m. thing, I have my routine in the morning, regardless if I feel good or bad, I'm going to stick to that you routine. And you know, it, it like you know, I, I hate to not, not to go down the Kobe Bryant path, but that Mamba mentality, that killer instinct to no matter how you're feeling, um, just stick to your routine, stick to your plan, and don't waver off that. And then over time, confidence builds because you get through those valleys and you say, okay, you know what? When I was down, I got through it. That was fine. And next time you feel you know discouraged or anxiety about something, you're like, okay, this is nothing. You brush it off your shoulder. Um, and each race prepares you. Each run prepares you for the next race. You know, so if you stick to your routine, you stick to your guns, and you really stay disciplined, um, I think those confidence things just kind of build over time, mm -hmm. and brick by brick, every day, win the day, um, that kind of mentality. I'll try not to get too uh, football coach here. But yeah, that's, no, that's kind of I, I how I think it. of it. I gotta. Ask, I don't think I've asked you this. Maybe, maybe last question of the day here. <laughs> What's like the toughest time you've had? professionally Ooh. and whether it was mindset maybe we should stick with mindset mm -hmm. but like maybe you weren't hitting the results you wanted to or yeah there's quite a few <laughs> so oh, obviously you. the one that sticks out most is that we had this deal that was supposed to land in december it was like these literally new year's eve we thought it was coming through and you know management and partners calling me say hey this is still gonna book right and like yeah absolutely good and then literally in the last hour it gets canceled for, for whatever reason and that was business. that was the most recent. I you know it, it literally felt like a breakup, and I was just like, wow, like I just couldn't. I, I didn't want to talk to my, my my partners or my managers about it. It's just very difficult. But that was tough. But I think one of the things that you know with confidence comes, you know, I, I don't think I'm egotistical, but I think with confidence you have to have a little bit of an internal ego. And so some of the things that I've had difficulty with is. Um, showing humility and not letting your ego get in the way. Like ask for help, broadcast that you've been, you got helped by somebody else. I think it's very easy, particularly for people to come out of college, especially like athletes or people that are super confident or try to give off the appearance that they're confident, is that they want to show the world that they're the greatest and show everybody that they do this and they do that. And so that goes back to the, the cube thing. You're just sitting in your cube all day because you're gonna show people that this is who you are. You do nothing but work. And then over time, you're like, you know what? I don't need to just, I don't need to show people that. Like, I know what I do internally. I'm confident inside. I know what I do behind the scenes. I know what I do when I'm not in front of you. And so I'm confident in that. Um, so when I first started, that was naturally how it was. I wanted to show everybody like, hey, this is me. I can do this on my own. And Zach Sexton, who's one of the founders and presidents of the company, you know, presented me with a good opportunity to really kind of go under his wing for the first three years. And with that, there was a lot of, you know, it was a big learning curve, a lot of pressure because it's the president of the company. It's one of the co-founders of the company. Yeah. That, you know, and you're shoulder to shoulder with the guy. So it's like, I can't screw this up, yeah. but I'm new. Yeah. And then naturally, especially in today's world, the industry change is changing so fast. You know, I haven't yes. been in the industry for 15 years. So people can say, oh yeah, I've been in it for 15 or 20 or 30 years. So you don't know, but it's like, hey man, like I see industry changes and I can see trends. I, I like to think I'm a smart guy to an extent, right? I so, can read books and like some blog posts. Yeah, like. so I looked at it, here's this young guy and he's getting trained under Zach. So outside looking in, it's kind of like this battle. It's like, is this guy doing anything or is he not doing anything? It's like, you know what, I'll, I, over time, I, I hope the results speak for itself. But it was definitely something I just kind of had to remove from my head. Like, hey, you know what, focus on what you're supposed to do and, and go from there. You know, it's particularly IBM's kind of dropped off for a little bit. So when Zach and I were tag teaming everything together, that was a big chunk of our business was Focusing IBM and IBM. then you know so now IBM's kind of was going down it's not you know selling as much so it's now now where do we go so if the sales are down that month everybody's well what the heck can you not manage this do you, can you not handle it and then you get pressure from that I'm like no we, we can handle this so we're trying to figure out different ways to grow the company or people that Zach was working with back in the in the past they might not be with the company anymore um, so it's like constantly trying to evolve the different organizational things whether how you recognize success and not success it's been a hurdle, it, you know, and there's always going to be scrutiny, you know, to an extent, which is good, you know, but um, pressure is a privilege, you know, pressure builds diamonds, people know that, so I, I enjoy it, um, but it's definitely a hurdle that I, I'm continuously jumping over, so yeah. um, not to get, you know, you know go down the, that route of how I got all started in procuring, but um, yeah, I'd say that's the hardest thing. Kind well, of it matters, and it's, it's advice for, I think, anybody trying to take a stab at their first job in mm -hmm. IT, like, you're gonna have an element of 
imposter syndrome if mm-hmm. you think about it that way. Mm-hmm. But if you're if you're on this journey to learn mm-hmm. and do the best you can at you know three months, six months, one year, two years, mm-hmm. like in discipline and routine helps that. You know, bake, sure. bake learning in, like, you oh, know, yeah. drop the ego, ask questions. Like, I know you ask a ton of questions, and, mm-hmm. and uh, like, that's how you got to learn. And yeah. it, it, especially if you're used to being super successful, you know, former college athlete. Yeah. Um, you, you know. I was never, I was not always financially successful. <laughs> well, I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm financially successful right now, but I mean, a lot of, a lot of times, you know, when you, when you get into the roles, it, maybe being Atlanta, originally from Savannah, um, but a lot of folks in Atlanta, you know, they have like this safety network of folks being here and all these different things. And I remember moving here. Kind of flying solo. A, a yeah. Flying New solo. Town, I yeah. literally, I literally, the day I moved here, I had, because I had just deposited money for my first month's rent. I had like $30 in my bank account. I think I, I went on a date with somebody and I went to go, uh, like this was a couple weeks later. I went to go on a date with somebody. I was like, oh, I got the drinks or whatever. And I got declined. It was like the most embarrassing oh, thing man. ever. And I, I was like, that is never going to happen. And so I was just trying to find all these different ways to make money. And I found some couches you could get off Craigslist and go sell them to other people and all this flip couches and stuff like yeah. that. And rent a truck from home. All these different things. But Dude, it, it sometimes it takes being at the bottom. It, whether yeah. I mean, whether it's financially or whatever. And that, that was like a, a, a good wake-up call and motivation to kind of take control of your career. And like yeah, yeah. It, it, work ethic, it is what you make of it. Yeah, but and to put things, I always put things in perspective. I mean, we're in the United States. I mean, when people say we're at the bottom, I mean, are we really at the bottom? You know what I mean? There's people that have it worse than us. So I try to put things in perspective. And yeah, there's goals and not having a lot of money in your bank account or, you know, other things or organizational struggles or personal times. Like, put things in perspective. Like, you have the ability to go out and really make something of yourself if you have the discipline to do it. And if yeah, you in have, the grand scheme, we're very privileged in a lot of ways living in the you know country we do being in the industry we're yeah, in having the privilege to to make your next really having the privilege to have the opportunity to make your own decision on something mm-hmm. so it's you know i look at it from that and if, and if you have a decision to get up then you have a benefit that rides over a lot of the population in the entire world it's different, it's different well I, I love it man i want to throw uh, a little kudos your way it's it's interesting guys uh zach is the only one at his company as a salesperson making regular content like this mm-hmm. and you've been at it now for a year and a half some year about, and a, about a year and a, yeah, yeah. It was something that, but it's a, it just a testament to you you know putting yourself out there mm-hmm. and kind of trying to make the most of what you got mm-hmm. and i think you know when i first started uh working with you and i had the chance mm-hmm. to and you were one of the first people I reached out to because mm-hmm. I'm like, hey man, that's awesome. And it's hard when you're on an island all by yourself. Oh doing my gosh, something. you're gonna get it's fun. People are gonna make fun of yeah, you. Yeah, people are gonna, gonna make fun like of this probably. They're gonna be like, yeah. I like your video, man. And you're like, is that like a good thing? Are you being sarcastic or what are you trying to say here? But you know, I was like, ah, oh, whatever, who cares? Yeah. You know, it's like, I mean, there's so many different ways. And again, I don't wanna get back into sales taxes, but there's so many ways to connect with your customer or customers or audience or whatever. Like. It's not just about calling. Like calling is one aspect, emailing is one aspect. But if you watch a video, I can promise you, somebody's more likely to watch the first ten seconds of that video than read the first ten seconds of a cold email or a call. Mm-hmm. So it's a very unintrusive way. So why not do it? It would be stupid to not do it, in my opinion. So as amateur as it is, you know, if you feel like you don't look good on camera, or you stutter or whatever, just do it. I mean, who cares? Like if you're if you're in sales, there's no reason you shouldn't be doing. You know, and especially if you feel like you can offer real value, you need to get your message out there. You'd be doing yourself a disservice if you did it. So, I love it, dude. Well, thanks so, so much yeah, for, for yeah, hopping on doing this. Yeah, doing this, this is, hopefully, this is the part one of many, and then hopefully, these things get yeah. more successful. Aaron's going to be this guru guy, the next Gary Vaynerchuk, and then hopefully, I, I'll be able to have some sales and some other things going on in my life. And the next interview will be more fun. We can say, hey, you know, look at us now. We could be at a skyscraper somewhere I mean, we're kind of a skyscraper but not really yeah. but <laughs> yeah well i mean you've been an inspiration for me like the, the podcast is just one or two minutes on this i, I started it because when you start your own company mm-hmm. like you have to put yourself out there you really yeah. have to you don't have the infrastructure of a business and so mm-hmm. i was like man i want to take a stab at this consulting thing i got to put myself out there and interviewing people like this mm-hmm. guys if there's one tip or trick like just talk to your friend and set up the camera or talk, grab your boss, bring them on camera. Um, talk to one of your best customers, bring them on camera because mm-hmm. just chatting, like literally all we did was talk and I don't know how valuable this was. I feel like there were some great nuggets in here and uh, it doesn't have to be rocket science and you can get started with 
yeah. with some of this some of this stuff. But I've since taken a break with even the podcast. Mm-hmm. Hearing you rekindle so it, yeah, 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 yeah. Hearing you rekindle it, it's like, well, like let's use an excuse together and rekindle. Yeah, like let's just keep it going. Yeah, keep, it keep, going. keep it going, and you stay relevant. And then some some people pick up on it, and you don't realize it. Like your content, a lot of people. You know, calls you can judge on how long you're on the phone for, or how many email correspondences you have. So, a video, it's hard to judge the monetary value or the engagement value in it, but just keep doing it. And then over time, like you look at, I don't know Seth personally like you do, but you look at like Seth. I remember when yeah, Seth, 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 Seth talked. There's a yeah. plug, Seth. Uh, yeah. Um, but you look at Seth, and you he's know, a household name. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah he, 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 he's not a Gary Vaynerchuk or somebody like that right now. Um, but I remember when he first posted, and um, it was like, I think he had like one like, and it was like an employee. And you know, the next thing you know, two weeks later, it's three likes. You're like, okay, so people are watching, people are engaging. And next thing you know, now he's got a great conversation, great dialogue on LinkedIn. Um, and he's a good guy. Yeah, he's a good guy. So it's like you want to, you can't not like Seth. Yeah, yeah. He's just a, like, I don't know him personally, so Seth, you know, we'll probably meet one day. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know him personally, but just just as an example of what I've seen. So you know, get the content out there, get it out there. You know, if if, if it sounds cheesy or whatever, you're embarrassed or stutter, or whatever, just get it out. Get out. And then it'll relate to somebody and then you build confidence and you get better at it. And then eventually like, you know, I'm just going to be myself and, you know, let the people decide what they want to decide. Let them judge, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Let them go. Let so, them. so, but I've enjoyed it. So hopefully this will be the first one. Maybe. Yeah. I love it, man. So, well, and thanks guys for watching. And until next time, peace. See ya.